If you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter 10, begin reading in verse 25, please. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now understand, this lawyer was not asking this from a sincere heart. He didn't want to know the answer to this question. It says he was testing Jesus. He, in the Greek, it means he was asking this in a sarcastic tone. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to the lawyer, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So the lawyer answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Now understand, the priest and the Levites were the ministers in that day. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, they were hated. Samaritans were despised in that day and culture. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Jesus asked the lawyer. And the lawyer said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Tom Gray lay down on the bar room floor, having drunk so much he could drink no more. So he fell asleep with a troubled brain to dream that he rode on a hell-bound train. The engine with fire was red and damp and brightly lit with a brimstone lamp. A demon for fuel was shoveling bones while the furnace rang with a thousand groans. The boiler was filled with yellow beard and the devil himself was the engineer. The passengers made such a motley crew, church member, atheist, Gentile, and Jew. Gorgeous young ladies and withered old hags, rich men in suits and beggars in rags, yellow and black men, red, brown, and white, all chained together, what a horrible sight. While the train descended on at a rapid pace, a hot wind scorched them on their hands and face. Hotter and hotter the train tracks grew, as faster and faster the engine flew. Then in the distance there rose such a yell, Oh no, croaked the devil, we're nearing hell. Then my, how the passengers shrieked out with pain and begged the devil to stop that hell-bound train. Darker and darker the train car became. They each knew no one else was to blame. Into that lake of fire they were thrown where the damned souls weep and moan. Tom Gray awoke with an agonized cry, his clothes soaked with sweat, his hair standing high. And he prayed as he'd never prayed before, to be saved from that bottle and serve the devil no more. The man who lay dying on the Jericho Road represents the lost people we will be coming in contact with, reaching out to, and ministering to during our upcoming evangelistic crusades in various cities throughout Kentucky. The Jericho Road was famous for being full of thieves and bandits and robbers. 
It was a treacherous, dangerous, deadly, portentous road. The Jericho Road represents and typifies the road of sin that sinners and backsliders walk upon. The world, the flesh, and the demons seek to steal, to kill, destroy, and devour, and decimate us on this road of sin. This road of sin is saturated with temptations, tests, and trials that seek our destruction. This road is permeated with perils and problems and satanic assaults that seek to kill us at every turn. As we get into this message this morning, I want to paint us a picturesque portrait of what these lost, dying, hurting, and broken people look like in their empty souls and in their darkened hearts and in their sad lives. The Holy Spirit wants to pull back the curtain and show us what is happening in the spiritual realm with these people who lay dying on the Jericho Road. If we read the entire chapter here in Luke 10, we will see the whole picture of what is really going on and why Jesus told this very pertinent and powerful parable. Listen, I'm talking to you members in this church this morning, you who are going to work in these crusades that Pastor Bob Rawlings has set up. Me and him's going to preach, but we need you to work. We need workers. We need ambassadors. We need warriors. We need people who's going to go out and help us evangelize these cities. Luke 10, Jesus has sent out the two of the 72 workers to go out and spread his message and to perform miracles in his name. They were going out on evangelistic crusades here in Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, 1 and 2 says, After these things Jesus appointed a 72 and sent them out two by two into every city and every place where he was going to travel and go and preach. Therefore Jesus said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers, workers, evangelists into the harvest. Luke 10, 17 and 19 says, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And I give unto you power, I send power, uh, to tread on serpents and on scorpions. And over all, not some, not half, not fifty percent, but over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You see, they'd been out praying for the sick and casting out demons and leading lost souls to Christ and preaching the gospel. And now they'd come back to give Jesus a full report. And they were overjoyed at what happened. Listen, we are God's laborers in his harvest fields, which we will be going to during these citywide crusades. We are God's workers and ambassadors and lights as we work in these fields, reaching out to the lost and the dying and the broken and the backslidden brother. We are his workers. We have a mission, a mandate and a message. What is our mission? To reach the lost for Jesus Christ in these crusades. What is our mandate? To hold these citywide crusades. What is our message? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. What is our message? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord Lord shall be saved. Our message is you're a sinner and you need a savior. You're a backslider and you need a deliverer. Your soul is sin sick and you're in need of the great physician. That's our message. And after this, a lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus very pointedly told this sarcastic lawyer, everyone in this world is your neighbor. Every mother's son and every father's daughter is your neighbor. Your co-worker is your neighbor. Your next door neighbor is your neighbor. Your family members are your neighbors. Your enemy who you can't stand and who can't stand you is your neighbor. The clerk down at the gas station is your neighbor. That cute little girl you're going through McDonald's drive-thru and you give your money to, she's your neighbor. 
Those who have been robbed and stripped and beaten, bloody and left for dead by the world, the flesh, and the devil on the Jericho Road are your neighbors. The outcast, the downcast, the lambasted, and the outlaws are your neighbors. Those that the world looks down upon are your neighbors. Those that everybody else has already given up on are your neighbor. Those laying in the streets with a needle in their arm are your neighbor. Those who sell their bodies on lonely street corners in the middle of the night are your neighbor. That homeless alcoholic bum living under the bridge is your neighbor. That runaway teenage girl who was being raped by her stepdaddy is your neighbor. That hard-working man who works hard every day, he don't cuss, drink, or party, but he needs Jesus. He's your neighbor. That outlaw biker running down the road on his Harley Davidson hog doing the work of the devil, he's your neighbor. That man addicted to pornography, that woman addicted to meth, that crack whore is your neighbor. That man selling drugs is your neighbor. That street gang member is your neighbor. It's your neighbor. The backslider is your neighbor. The black sheep of the family is your neighbor. The pervert and the pimp, they're your neighbor. The bullies and the hoodlums, they're your neighbor. The devil worshiper and the witch, they're your neighbor. Everybody in this world is my neighbor and they need Jesus Christ as their savior. I've pastored three churches over the past 30 years of ministry. And every church where I served as pastor, I went to the local police department. And I said, I want you to give me the name, the phone number, the address of the meanest, baddest, toughest man in this county. And I went after them for Jesus. They were my neighbor. I went where everybody else was scared to go to. And I invited those hardcore sinners to, to, to my church and to accept Jesus. I went after the bootleggers. I went after the drug addicts. I went after the drug dealers. I went to where the hungry babies were and we fed them. I went to the poor side of town. I went into the slums and we found the bums. They were my neighbor. They needed Jesus. They needed Jesus. They needed Jesus. These people coming to, to our crusades, they're going to be need Jesus. They're that man dying on the Jericho Road. They need Jesus. They say, preacher, why do you cry when you sing? Why do you cry when you preach? If you've had Jesus do for you what Jesus has done for me, you might cry too. If you've been in a place with God where I've been with God, brother, you might shed a tear too. I've seen faces of hell. I've heard the moans and the groans from that brimstone lake of fire. Listen. Now, here's where you're not going to love me anymore. Do you love me? You've got to love me to get to heaven. Do you love me? The modern-day church will not help this man lying on the Jericho Road. Religion cannot help this man. Religion is powerless to help this man. Religion is incapable of helping this man. Religion does not have the spiritual tools to help this man. Religion has no oil nor wine to pour into his wounds. All religion has are the doubly dead traditions of men which can help no one. All religion has are the crusty, dusty, dry, depleted, sanctimonious, parched, barren, stale ceremonies which can help no one. Religion has never helped any man at any time in history. Why? Because it cannot you can go to your Mormon temple. You can go to your Jehovah Witnesses church. You can go to your Catholic church and say your Hail Marys. You can rub Buddha's belly until your fingers turn blue. But it will not save one soul. It will not set one soul free. It will not break the power of the devil in a man's life. Religion. Will not help this man dying on the Jericho Road. Religion will not stop to help this man. 
Religion sees the dying man laying there, but he crosses on the other side and walks right on by. Most modern day churches have no soul winning programs to reach out to this man. Listen to me. I called 25 churches in my city where I live here in Kentucky. I ask him a simple question. Does your church have an active soul winning outreach program to reach this city? And I'm here to tell you that not one of those churches that I called told me they have an active soul winning program. God help us. God help us. God help us. So winning is not their top priority. So winning is not their number one mission. So winning is not in their agenda. So winning is not in their plans. So winning has no place in their budgets. While these sinners and backsliders lay dying on the Jericho Road, bleeding, wounded, half dead, been beat up by the devil, been beat up by life, been beat up by sin. And all these churches, they're too busy building three million dollar churches with gymnasiums and swimming pools in them. They're too busy building their own little kingdom instead of building God's kingdom. They're too busy trying to please and appease everyone with their positive messages on how to get healthy and wealthy and rich. They're too busy trying to entertain their crowd with smoke bombs and strobe lights and rock and roll music in the pulpit. They're too concerned about their church softball team and watching the Super Bowl. They're too busy going on vacations down to the Caribbean and laying on the, on the beaches of Bahama. They're too busy going to, down to their little Bible studies with their little yellow and their little blue highlighters and highlighting their favorite little passages of Scripture and drinking their Starbucks and eating their donuts over at Donald's house. God help me. Help me. I don't like religion. They're too busy buying their thousand dollar Armani shark skin suits and wearing their Pierre Cardin designer dresses and driving their, driving their Lexuses and their Escalades to church and letting everybody know how rich and important they think they are while they shine and polish their little halo and they think they're God's special little pet. They're too busy teaching their youth group how to do the Harlem Shake, dancing like somebody on a strip club. They're too busy going down here to Two Keys Tavern down on Limestone Street, dancing to the boot scooting boogie. They're too busy watching the Kardashians and how to be a millionaire in the voice. Modern day church is more concerned with basketball than they are a lost soul died on the Jericho Road. They're more concerned with the final four than they are the final judgment. They're more concerned with John Calipari over at UK basketball than they are with Jesus Christ. They're more concerned with a rubber ball going through a hoop than a dying man lying on the Jericho Road. Oh, they see that man, but they don't stop to help or to minister to him or try to tell him about Jesus. And the sad thing is, the cults are doing their job. I've had Mormons stop and talk to me about joining the Mormon temple. The Jehovah Witnesses, they beat my door down over in Georgetown. They won't leave me alone. They're doing their job. But I can't tell you the last time I ever had a Christian or a Christian preacher ever knock on my door and invite me to church or invite me to Jesus. 
But Jesus said, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come unto me. Jesus said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's what Jesus said to do. Now, Paul asked us a very pointed question in Romans 10. He said, how are they, talking about these people dying on the Jericho Road, how are they to believe in Christ if they've never even heard of Christ? How can they hear without someone preaching the gospel to them, sharing the gospel with them? How can we preach unless we're sent out by the church? These churches don't even have any soul winning programs. God help us. Let me tell you something. It's God's will that Bob Rawlings do these evangelistic crusades, and I'm honored to be a part of them. I'll tell you that right now. It's God's will that we go wherever a door opens to us. It's God's will that we go down on Skid Row. It's God's will that we go into the ghettos and into the inner cities and preaching Jesus. It's God's will that we reach one hand down into the gutter and one into glory and reconcile a sin-addicted race of humanity to a thrice holy God. It's God's will. It's God's will. Let me tell you something. A church that does not have an active soul winning program is not a New Testament church. A church that does not go door to door in their community inviting people to meet Jesus is not a New Testament church. They may be a country club, but they're not a New Testament church. They might be an entertainment center, but they're not a New Testament church. They may be a social club, but they're not a New Testament church. They may sing like a mockingbird and pray like Daniel, but they are not a New Testament church. They may have a gold trim baptistry, but they're not a New Testament church. They may have crystal chandeliers, but they're not a New Testament church. They may have Persian carpet and silk drapes, but they're not a New Testament church. They may have 5,000 members, but they're not a New Testament church. They may have ceramic tile and marble top counters, but they are not a New Testament church. They may be on the radio and the internet and television, but they are not a New Testament church. They may have a young, good-looking, handsome pastor who has a silver tongue that drips with honey when he speaks, but they are not a New Testament church. Now listen to me. Let me switch gears now. Let me switch gears. The Good Samaritans, that's me, that's you, that's you, that's you, that's you, Brother Bob, that's you, Martha, that's you, Sister Kim, that's you, Brother Dave, that's you, John, that's you. We are the Good Samaritans as we go and conduct these crusades as God opens the doors here in central Kentucky. Everybody who plays a part in these crusades is a good Samaritan. If your job is to sing, then you're a good Samaritan. If your job is to pray, then you're a good Samaritan. If your job is to take up the offering, then you're a good Samaritan. If your job is to greet folks as they come in the door of that building, wherever we're going to be, then you are a good Samaritan. If your job is to stand out on the street with a sign advertising the crusade, then you are a good Samaritan. If your job is to get on the phone and call someone to invite them to the crusade, then you are a good Samaritan. If your job is to get on Facebook and other social media sites on the internet and invite folks out to these crusades, then you are a good Samaritan. There are no big eyes or little U's in this evangelistic endeavor that God has called Bob Rawlings to undertake. We all play a vital, crucial, critical, and beneficial role in these crusades. We all have a very important job to do in these crusades. Listen, listen. Souls are hanging in the balance. The Lord spoke this to me very clearly. Souls are hanging in between life and death. Souls are dangling in between heaven and hell. The devil's on their backs. They are dead in their sins, walking dead men, spiritual zombies. 
They are addicted to sin. They are addicted to idols. They are laying in the Jericho Road half dead. They are laying there with the grim reaper by their side. They are laying in the Jericho Road with no hope in this world, unable to get up on their feet, and they're bleeding and dying from the wounds inflicted by the perils and the problems, calamities, tribulations, and troubles caused by sin. They've been robbed by the devil. They've been stripped by the devil. They've been beaten up by the devil. And they've been left for dead by the devil. And the devil thinks they're out for the count. And there they lay this morning, this Sunday morning, with a hangover. And there they lay with a heart filled with emptiness. And there they lay head hanging low. <laughs> and there they lay the feet dragging the floor. And there they lay without enough strength to even get up on their feet. And there they lay this Sunday morning, not remembering what happened last night. And there they lay this morning singing a sad song, living a sad life. And there they lay this morning after the party's over. And there they lay this morning, all their fair with their friends are gone. And there they lay this morning, looking for a good Samaritan to come along and just help them. And there they lay this morning, looking for one of our crusades to show up in their city. Now listen. For some of these people, for some of these people, these crusades will be their last chance to ever meet Jesus. For some of these folks, these crusades will be their final opportunity to ever meet Jesus. God has been calling and calling and dealing with them time and time again. And these crusades will be their last opportunity. They will never get another call from God. The Lord spoke this to my heart. They will never, ever get another call from God. We've got to go. We have no other choice or option or alternative. Some will die and split the gates of hell wide open if we do not go. We have to go, Brother Bob. We have to go, church. We've got to go, singers. We have to go, evangelists. We've got to go do these crusades for Christ. David Wilkerson was a skinny little country preacher from Barnesboro, Pennsylvania. In 1958, he was a pastor in a small church in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. When he saw a Life magazine cover, and on the cover it pictured several street gang members from Bronx, New York. They had all received life sentences for murder. The Lord began to deal with Dave Wilkerson. He resigned that church and went to New York, and he began holding outdoor youth crusades that would eventually lead hundreds and thousands of young people to Christ. And one I want to tell you about right now as I close, one of those young warlords in a street gang was named Nicky Cruz. He was a warlord of one of the most feared street gangs called the Mau Maus. The Lord put it on David Wilkerson to go after Nicky. He went after Nicky Cruz and he wouldn't give up. One day Nicky Cruz pulled a switchblade knife and he said, You crazy preacher, I'll cut you into a thousand pieces and leave you, and leave you laying where you lie. And David Wilkerson said, Nicky, you can cut me into a thousand pieces, but every piece will be crying out, I love you, and Jesus loves you, Nicky. And today, Nicky Cruz has preached to over 45 million people in his own ministry because a skinny little country preacher obeyed God and began conducting crusades and led this demon-possessed madman to Jesus. The love of God broke his heart and softened him. And Nicky Cruz dropped his knees and asked Jesus into his heart. Listen now. I can't take a heart that's broken. 
make it over again. But I know a man who can. I cannot take a soul that's sin sick, make it white as snow, but I know the man who can. I can't walk upon the waters or calm the troubled sea, but I know a man who can. I can't cause blinded eyes to open or make the lame to walk again, but I know the man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. But I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. Hey, if you feel no one can help you, and your life is out of control, I'm telling you, I know the man who can. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Stand to your feet this morning. Just say, Jesus. Raise your hands up and just say, Jesus. Jesus. I want to make this all call very specific. as my custom is. Number one, if you're in this room this morning, you don't know Jesus. I'm not going to beg you. If the Holy Ghost ain't dealing with you, I can't do a thing for you. But if he is, if you feel that tug of your heart, I want you to come and stand by me right here, please. I want to pray for you. I want to help you find your way to Jesus. It's not hard. It's not hard. And once you start serving him, it's going to be rough. But it's not hard to accept. Anywhere in the room, anywhere in this auditorium, come on down. If you don't know Jesus, if you're a backslider, come on down. Next, if you want to work in these crusades, I want to invite you to come and stand right here to my left. Thank you, thank you for coming. You want to, you feel led to work? Thank you. Work in these crusades. Come on, I see. Come on. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you come. As we get a song together, God bless you.